Hey, what's up, everybody? Welcome to the Club Metapod. I'm Mark Fernandez, and I'm joined today by Dr. Chris Ferry. How are you, Dr. Chris? Is it Dr. Chris well. or Dr. Ferry? Oh, uh, you know, whatever. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. But you're you're doing good. Yeah, thanks for having me. Yeah. So, so, um, Dr. Chris and I, or Dr. Ferry and I, were just talking before we started, saying that how much I'm appreciative of you uh, joining me. This is, you know, our first podcast. This is episode one. We do have a bunch of talent booked, so you know, be sure to stick around and check out all the amazing talent that we have uh, coming on the show from the world of, of video games and science and politics and crypto and all kinds of eclectic topics. But um, I got to say that your specialty is one of my um, you know, fascinations in life. I consider myself a little bit of an amateur physicist. You know, without knowing any mathematics, you know, I'm more into the poetic side of physics. Um, so I got to ask you the question, um, how did you start your journey into the world of physics? Uh, I, I guess it's the opposite of you, actually. So um, I, I, I enjoyed mathematics, actually, when I was when I was a kid. So I was kind of one of the lucky ones that stayed ahead of the curve and, um, you know, it felt good to get accolades that, saying you were good at mathematics. And then I took a high school physics class and I realized just how useful it was to in solving problems, like solving real world problems. So when I went to university, I still wanted to study mathematics, but I had a minor in physics mm -hmm. and it, it was just, it was incredible how much easier I found the study of physics, at least sort of at the university level when when they only test you on mathematical problems, uh, when when you already had a mathematical background, so it's kind of like I came from the mathematical side of things, realizing that hey, this is a place where you know I can put my expertise to good use. And, and what what do you think that sort of the that delta is that leap that you take from being good at math to transferring that kind of knowledge of math into physics? Because like when I look at the world. Um, I kind of see it at the center of our understanding of the universe is math. And then right outside of math is the circle of physics. And then outside of physics, you have chemistry, then you have biology, and then you have consciousness. It's kind of like my simple way of understanding, you know, like the universe. Mm -hmm. How do you cross over from math to physics? Yeah, so I think the way that I think about it is, you know, we, we have all of these, I don't really think of them sort of building up that way. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I, I think of all, all of these things as just out there and they're, they're connected via various paths through the stories that we tell ourselves uh, about the world. And many of the most useful stories are kind of ones written in this language of mathematics. Mm -hmm. But that's not to say like, you know, the, the, the story that, that you have, I think, is is a useful one in the sense that uh, the world is really complex. So you kind of want to simplify things when, when you can. And, and this reductionist picture of like, you know, so like sociology is about people. People are made of of biological stuff. Biological stuff is made of molecules and, and chemistry. And that's yeah. made of atoms and physics. And that and that is ultimately built on top of mathematics. That's a perfectly fine story but i think one thing to remember is like the at the base of it all is not mathematics at the base of it all is just our experience mm. and the stories that we tell ourselves that's interesting um the the you know kind of jumping you know right into some of my you know sort of physics fantasies if you will um like i get so kind of excited you know when i think about because it, it makes me feel like I have an understanding of it that, you know, the universe started off as hydrogen, right? If I'm not getting that wrong, I always confuse hydrogen and helium, right? But hydrogen is one, one, right? Yeah. Yep, yeah. Yep. And then hydrogen took some time to become helium, right? And it happened, as my understanding of it, in a very simple way by sort of, you know, accretion and, and, and becoming more dense and whatever and, and, and heavier, and gra you know, whatever made it, you know, condense into evolving into this helium thing. Do, do you have an idea or is there kind of a, a, a understanding of how long, you know, if the universe is quote unquote 14 billion years old, 
how long did that helium uh, i'm i'm sorry that hydrogen to helium epoch take yeah so the the way we understand it is at the really early universe everything was was dense uh everything was closer together so it was really hot uh and there was enough sort of enough energy for the stuff that makes up uh hydrogen which is quarks i don't mm. know so these are like even smaller than than protons and neutrons and electrons that you that you hear about um and so as the universe expanded it cooled and early on things just had so much energy that they just bounced bounced around bounced off each other you know it, it was it, i imagine it as uh, like, uh, like, you know, those sort of loop and hook sort of, uh, fuzzy things where there's like, <laughs> there's a game where you have paddles and you throw, throw like a tennis ball and it will stick to the paddle. Yes. Uh, it's like Vel Velcro is the, I guess yeah. the, the trademark name for it. Yeah. Uh, so imagine like you have a ball, it's made of Velcro and another one's like fuzzy. If you throw them at, if you throw them at each other they'll stick together. But if you throw them fast enough, they'll just bounce off each other, right? So there's mm. like this magic sort of amount of energy to get them to stick together. So the universe was so hot that they just bounce off each other. And then it cooled and expanded and they were able to stick together, but it kind of cooled too fast. So for most of the universe, there was only hydrogen and no helium because there wasn't, uh, there wasn't enough energy. There wasn't enough chances for the two hydrogens to get together to make helium. And then uh, gravity starts to take over and pull all of this hydrogen together. And then that creates stars. So all mm -hmm. of the helium or the vast majority of the helium that we have in the universe is made in, in stars. And the, yeah, I'm sorry, go ahead, go ahead. I'm sorry. Yeah. 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 So, so it's like for most of the universe, it's just hydrogen gas floating around. Gravity pulls it all together. It creates stars. And if there's enough of it, like huge stars, it burns hydrogen into helium incredibly fast. So like a, a massive star can create helium, you know, in fractions of a second. Uh, but our star burns it slowly. So mm. our star will, will, you know, will last billions of years, slowly turning hydrogen into helium. And all of the other elements that we have were made either in stars as they burn their, their hydrogen fuel into bigger elements uh, or in supernova explosions of, of massive stars. So, so that, and like where I'm driving at, I'm kind of driving somewhere because I actually uh, am of the opinion that the planet earth is actually an ancient planet. It like in the context of the universe, right? Cause the planet earth, as I understand it, it's about 4 billion years old. The universe yeah. is about 14 billion years old. That's like, you know, mm -hmm. that's like, I'm not sure what the percentage is. I don't want to say something stupid, but it's like, you know, it's a good percentage of the 14, right? At 25, whatever it is. Um, so it seems like the earth has been here for a long time, right? So I'm just trying to get an understanding. How long did it take for that helium to make that first star? Was it a billion years or was it something that happened theoretically in a few hundred thousand years? You know, like, 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 you know, like I'm trying to get... Yeah. A, a deeper context because what I'm really driving at is obviously aliens, right? You know, like that's where I'm getting at. Cause that's mm -hmm. what I want to ask you about eventually, but I'm just trying to contextualize the earth in the context of the universe as an ancient world. And cause that's my personal theory that we're actually very ancient. And that's why we're so evolved. Like, you know, the, the chemistry and the biology evolved into the consciousness and it took, took billions of years for that to happen. Um, and people are, you know, always told me, oh, well, there could be a race out there that's a billion years more advanced than us. Um, and I find that, like, you know, a little bit tough to believe because I feel like it's taken a really long time to evolve us, you know. Mm. Uh, and I know I'm kind of jumping way to the end of the story there. But <laughs> is there is there a little bit of context in terms of when those first stars started to explode into supernova and created those heavier elements? Yeah, I mean, we we know pretty well i don't know the number off the top of my head but sure. it's you know yeah say like hundreds of thousands of years okay. or hundreds of millions of years to, uh, to, you know the hundreds of thousands of millions <laughs> is when like the first stars started to form um and small stars that were formed at the beginning of the universe will still exist so mm -hmm. like the smallest stars 
they burn their their fuel so so slowly that they'll last you know f for as long as we can imagine mm -hmm. um the 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 really massive ones have exploded sent out their all of their stuff and that has come back together with gravity exploded again so you know we don't know how many sort of the stuff that we're made of right mm -hmm. the the carbon in my body i don't know how many explosions of supernova <laughs> that's been through Right. Um, but it, it's been at least one. I, it's been at least that. one. That's I mean, that's mind blowing. That's mind blowing, yeah. you know, in and of itself. Um, do, do you do any experimental uh, physics or is your work uh, purely in the educational side or do you actually do any practical experiment uh, like like experimental stuff yourself? Uh, my some of the research that happens in, in my group is closer related to experiments, mm -hmm. but there's sort of a yeah, there's really a dichotomy between experimental physics and theoretical physics. Uh, and occasionally we meet together and I'll get to go into a lab and, and discuss experiments. But so usually what happens is there's another experimental group and they see one of our theoretical ideas and, and they want to test it out in their lab. So we have to collaborate closely, but my, myself and my students don't ever, or they're not the ones that go into the lab and mm -hmm. create the experiments and, and analyze the data and stuff. Because with physics, the experimentation has gotten, and like, look, I've been very lucky that I've had a chance to interview uh, folks like Brian Green and Sean Carroll and Neil deGrasse Tyson. So like, I'm really into this stuff and they all look <laughs> at me like, you know, like I have three eyes, you know, sometimes, but what, <laughs> one of the things that, that I, I am fascinated by is that the experimental side of physics has a huge barrier to enter because there's so much, you know, like you're saying, energy required to explore new physics beyond what we already know and test and can like, you know, uh, use as like, okay, this is like knowledge um, that the, the, the amount of hardware required to explore new physics is very difficult to attain. Right. I mean, that, that's mm -hmm. a huge barrier into getting into experimental physics yeah absolutely i mean the for, for example this james webb telescope that mm -hmm. that's in the news right now has been delayed many times is, is i guess uh, currently it's supposed to fly up on christmas day uh you know it's tens of billions of dollars to yeah. to create that thing and you know nasa's is this public institution that you know collaborates with people all over the world which is great so people in Australia and, and people in Europe and all over the world get to access this data and have time to use the telescope, which is great. But if you wanted to say on your own, test some theory that requires something <laughs> like the James Webb telescope, well, you would need, yeah, m many tens of billions of dollars sure. and another 10,000 engineers to, to create it, which is yeah, a that's, challenge. Yeah, yeah. That's amazing. That's amazing. It's like, on one side of the equation, you have like this incredible gift of understanding these super complicated things. But the reality in practice is that you need an incredible amount of energy to actually put any of that knowledge, you know, to bear. You know, it's it, it's it's really fascinating. So going going to that James Webb, uh, t is, is that right? James Webb? Yeah. Uh, yeah. So what what I've been reading about it is that, you know, people like the headline is that you know this telescope allows you to look back in time and to mm. me i look up at the stars and I, I i know i'm looking back in time you know and that this is something that we've known since we were little kids what what what's what makes this james webb telescope so special it's just it's just better components than the last one we put up there so it, it has higher resolution uh the, when you look at stars we we see visible light mm -hmm. Of course, there's much more light than visible light. You have this whole electromagnetic spectrum from radio waves all the way to cosmic cosmic rays. So the you know we want things that can see more of the spectrum and at a higher resolution. So w w that that satellite will be a, a telescope will be able to see farther in distance, which translates to farther in the past just because it's improvement on technology. Mm. And is this something that is um, the, the images of the telescope are going to be publicly available or is this, or is this like a public oh, yeah. trust or is, 
It is, huh? Yeah. 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 So like the the first images will be uh, nowadays, like it, there's there's complications in terms of like media embargoes and all that kind of stuff. But anyway, the first images will eventually, you know, appear on NASA's website and and be in the news. Um, yeah. So everything that's done on that with that telescope will be public. All the data will be publicly available. But, you know, you have to keep in mind that it it. Even I wouldn't be able to take the data and analyze it because it's not my specialty, right? It's just sure. going to be a, a database of nonsense to me. So right, you know, it takes right, right. it takes like you know, uh, ten years of getting a PhD in astrophysics to to understand what that raw data is showing you. When we see pictures, like the one behind me is a picture from NASA, um, that I probably from the Hubble telescope. Uh, it you know if if my eyes had better resolution i still wouldn't see the picture as it appears behind me right like that's right. all created with algorithms and and probably it wasn't taken in with in the visible spectrum and so you have to modify the data so that it makes sense to someone who's looking at it with you know our you know water filled <laughs> uh eyeballs you, you know what i've and i definitely want to get into your books but I know that recently, and I'm not sure exactly in the order of your publishing where this came in, but recently you wrote a book called uh, "Where Does Where Does the Universe Come From?" I believe is the title. Yeah. And where does um, the universe come from? And other cosmic questions. <laughs> yes. Is this is this book uh, also geared towards a younger audience, or or it seems like it's a little bit more mature, right? Like it's more. Yeah. It, it, it's more for like the high school and like early college level. Is that is that where you would put it? Yeah, I think it's for uh, it's for an adult audience. So it, you know, it's for science enthusiasts. Um, it it there isn't a lot of jargon in it, um, and yeah. So it, I think you know a keen high schooler, you know, someone someone in high school that's really interested in physics, uh, definitely get something out of it. Um, yeah. So it's it's for you know ostensibly for for, for everyone, but you know it's a, it's the size and length of a, an adult nonfiction book. Cool. And this one I haven't had the pleasure of, of digging into, but what was kind of like the thesis that you had in mind when you mm. set out uh, to uh, write mm. this book? Oh, there's a couple. One of them is, as a quantum physicist, I I look out and see scientific, science communicators. You mentioned some great ones already. Mm. Um, and not all of them are, are astrophysicists, but they talk about cosmology. They show you pictures of st like distant galaxies and stars and stuff. And I've always lamented the fact that well, we don't let quantum physicists talk about quantum physics in the in in public. Uh, mm -hmm. I don't know why. Maybe it's just, it's it's less inspiring than yeah, photos of space. But everything we understand about the universe, uh, from cosmology to to how to build a computer, has its roots in quantum physics. It's amazing. So, Quantum physics is like the basis of everything that we take for granted. So I wanted to, you know, write a book about this popular thing, cosmology, like these big questions that people have about the universe and, and w w where it's been and where it's going and why it looks the way it does, and really explain how quantum physics gives us the answers to these questions. That's awesome. Um, and and um, I've, you know, it's so funny. Um, I was hanging out with one of my bandmates um, last night and I was, you know, telling him about, um, you know, that I was interviewing you and like, he, he literally walked upstairs and came down with one of the books. <laughs> um, and uh, you know, that his, you know, his, you know, he gave it to his son when he was very young and his son now is very, very good at mathematics. And this is the first time that I read one of your books. And then I've read like, maybe I'd say eight or nine since then, because, you know, for the audience out there, they're very short and they're actually, mm -hmm quite challenging. And I'm a, you know, I'm an old man. So even I was challenged, <laughs> but you know, by them, um, there was a few questions I had specifically about, you know, your books. Number one, you, you seem to be very consistent with this, um, sort of, um, analog of the ball. Mm -hmm. is, is, is that something that you've been able to sort of almost get like some positive feedback from like young, very young people that the ball is something that they can wrap these super complex ideas around? Yeah, it's a great question. Um, one of the 
one of the like the challenges for me is that you know I can't go out and solicit uh, feedback from the target audience, which is <laughs> children, right? Uh, so yeah, so but I think the books primarily I I think are for parents, and I get a mm, lot of feedback from parents. So this is sort of like the classic thing that happens is uh, people when when I speak to people, even independent of the books, and they they realize that I'm a mathematician, their response is usually, oh, I hated math in school, which is kind of a weird thing to say to someone after they tell you <laughs> what, right. what, what they do in love. But <laughs> right. uh, And especially around the schoolyard, I see this all the time, especially with young girls, is that um, if their child shows any sort of like hesitation towards mathematics, parents that didn't like mathematics in their own schooling often show a sign of relief that they no longer have to engage with mathematics. Wow. Because, you know, obviously there's someone that, you know, has a job and, you know, seems to be at least somewhat successful without knowing any mathematics. So it's fine for their children to not know any mathematics. So one of the things I, I see with my books is that people who have this sort of fear and anxiety about math, science, and technology, they read these books and and because they all start kind of with this familiar thing, like this is a ball, it, it, it comforts them, right? Like, oh, it's not so scary after all, mm. right? This is this is this is simple, right? I, I understand a ball, <laughs> so right. I should be able to to understand the rest of this. Yeah, you know what one one thing of you know you bring up such an interesting point because um, I was terrible at math. I was absolutely terrible at math. Um, I still am, you know, like I couldn't even figure out what percentage four is out of 14, you know, it's, it's probably easy. <laughs> Do you know what that is off the top of your head? No, I mean, the, the mathematicians aren't very good at arithmetic. <laughs> right, right. So I would say like, I would, I would guess that you're actually pretty good at math because, you know, being in the space that you're in and that your background, it requires a lot of mathematics and mathematics is in some sense, it's just the ability to think abstractly. You know, that's and very it's interesting. Not, it's not just arithmetic. Yeah, you know, Brian Greene told me the same exact thing you just did. And Brian Greene's one of my heroes, and I've been so <laughs> lucky to have had some great chats with him. I'm sure you're familiar with him. Yeah. Um, and Brian Greene told me the same exact thing that you did. He's like, you're not talking about math. You're talking about arithmetic, you know, very, very specifically. Because that's like, that's the CPU in your brain having to make very specific calculations. I know how to do the percentage of four into 14, like, like I know how to do it. It's just a matter of doing it right. That's, that's where it jumps from arithmetic. Oh, I'm, yeah. From arithmetic, you know, to, uh, from math to arithmetic, I should say. Um, but, um, in, in any case, um, what do you think are some ideas that, that, that schools can embrace to make math quote unquote less boring or to mm. sort of, compel young people to understand how beautiful this universal language is and it's not universal language like i know it and somebody in a bordering country knows it it's literally the the language of the universe you know how how can this be romanticized a little bit you think with younger people oh that's a i mean that's a huge question right, right. That's people have been dollars, arguing right. about <laughs> uh, so you know I have a lot of critical things to say about schooling systems all over the world. Oh, please. Um, <laughs> but, you know, before I, before I say any of them, I will say, you know, it clearly we, they work in some sense. Like we created a, because of un universal education in many countries, you know, we created a society that no longer just kills each other um, mm -hmm. and has some, you know, at least some small common uh reality that they they share although that's kind of being eroded with social media um yeah so you know i think there's an extreme version of schooling that i like it there, there's it goes by many names and there's many like related models but the, the one in the u.s is, is called um S sudbury valley and it's mm. basically a school is slippery a valley i'm sorry did you say slippery S Sud sudbury sudbury yeah. valley okay sudbury yeah. valley yeah so it was the the kind of simple philosophy is that life is education so you you the what the school is 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 a, it's democratic so 
there's there's no leader there's no leadership every decision in the school gets voted on by everyone from the kindergartners to the year 12 students and, and the, yeah exactly <laughs> <laughs> uh and uh and the the teachers aren't teachers they're facilitators so uh, you know mm -hmm. kids come in and say look i'm interested in like motorcycles and so the teachers help them try to acquire like an old broken motorcycle that oh, the kids can and that kid learns math um through trying to fix this motorcycle and in, and then the, and then there's like an eight-year-old who's like oh well, that's interesting and so they sit around and they watch and uh you know they maybe they learn about some mathematics or they learn to read because they really want to fix this motorcycle but they have to read the manual so there's no there's no curriculum like no one's like forced to taught to read but everybody ends up learning to read through their own their own their own way um you know so i i think this is it's a bit difficult to say recommend that that's the model that everyone should have because i think that would just dis descend into chaos but it mm. seems to work at least in these small experiments where they do it the the problem i think with with the education system is we just go keep going back to this obsession with with uh metrics and ranking people and it becomes very difficult if you have sort of an open-ended style education to assess people right how do you how do you assess someone if there's no tests right yeah uh, how do you how do you rank someone to say who gets into college and who doesn't if there's no sats so i think somehow we need to get around this obsession with assessing people with these things because that, that really is the core of what drives the education to be so boring because whatever is we, we default to what's easy to assess yeah what, what what's the name of that of that unit um you know one of my friends is very involved in the education uh world and there's like a a, a unit of measurement i think it's the rock i want to say the rockefeller standard or there's some kind of Anyway, um, he's going to kill me for not remembering that. But um, the the yeah, it, it's you know the the SATs for example. Like, I I scored terrible in the SATs. I scored terribly in my IQ test that I took when I was a kid. You know, like embarrassing scores, um, which look might might actually be indicative of learning disabilities that I have. But when I left home at 18 years old and I went to New York City. I was able to practically get around and, you know, innovate on stuff, you know? Mm -hmm. um, so it's like, it's really interesting what you're saying, this kind of experiential learning, uh, you know, model, which I actually think is, is the real key of what I hope VR kind of gets adopted into, you know, because I've, I've read studies and I don't know how accurate these studies are because they're coming from Facebook. Right. So of course they're going to be, you know, <laughs> uh, like on the positive side, but um, that um, um, medical students that learn how to um, do a certain complicated um, uh, uh, surgical procedures in VR are like 68% better at them in practical settings over the people that just learned them in the old traditional way of doing it. And like, for me, I love VR. Do you play VR by any chance? Are you inside VR at all? Okay. <laughs> awesome. Well, look, you gotta, you gotta um, send me your uh, Oculus email. Cause I gotta get you into my game. Cause I really would love to show you what I'm building at club metaverse. But, um, you know, when, when I play ping pong with my buddies, you know, there's a couple of ping pong games out there, Table 11, I'm sure you've seen them. Or even lately, I've been playing Golf Plus. Um, with ping pong, I've noticed a one-for-one -one improvement when I play ping pong in real life from playing it inside of the VR game. And, right. and to me, that's a mind-blowing thing because that's the beauty of the, of the promise of the simulation, right? That the simulation... Mm -hmm gives you that experiential uh, muscle memory that actually allows you to improve at something, you know? And for me, being able, and look, I have I have a development team, so I'm very lucky that I get to do experiments. And I've tried to do mathematic games on purpose just to see if I can teach algebra 
easier inside VR than I can, you know, outside of it. I still don't really know it too much outside, to be honest with you. But, you know, algebra seems to be like I've heard from this same friend of mine who's into education that algebra is the number one point where they lose students like that. Hmm. That's the first big uh, filter, you know, kind of like in space, right? Like, like that's the first filter that when you hit algebra, you lose like 30 percent of your students, you know, I can and, believe that. Yeah. And, and so how you know, is there a better methodology of teaching that algebra so that people see it as a problem to solve and get excited about that solving versus giving into its complexity, you know? Yeah, it's a good question. I think for me, I like to view technology as a tool. And I think you hit on a few points there, like the ping pong game improves something that you do in real life. And I, I think that's the one of the things that we lose when we, especially for, for children, when they in, interact with technology and well, certainly for adults, but they're mm. not, most adults aren't interested in, in, in any sort of growth at this point. Um, <laughs> but for children, you know, the, the problem is that they're given technology w sometimes without any purpose. Mm. So, I, I think if you use technology as a tool that's connected to something that you want to actually improve upon in the real world, like, uh, you know, surgeries or, or, t or, or ping pong, right? I, I don't think you would see the same effects if those students actually had no interest in improving upon their skills in the real world, right? Mm. So they start with, I want to be the best surgeon and this this VR thing seems to help. So I'm, I'm going to interact with it so that I achieve this goal at, at the end. Now for the problem, I think for math is like, I, I don't think that kids really want to improve upon this sort of abstract notion of being good at, at algebra that doesn't seem to be connected with anything that they could possibly be interested in. Right. So I think you can use the VR, by first creating some sort of challenge that they want to solve mm. that requires algebra to yeah. solve it, or you just have to, to find something in the real world that they want to do and achieve that requires algebra and then build, you know, build a simulation within VR that allows them to, to explore that simulated reality. But it, I think it always has to be connected to something in the real physical world. Yeah, that that's really interesting. It, 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 um, it brings up this kind of notion where when you're starting to filter the potential of education, it's to get some kind of sense of aptitude. And maybe aptitude is the wrong word, but to get some kind of sense of, of interest of, of where this child you know, what, what makes him excited? You know, like, mm -hmm. is he, is he into the idea of socializing? Is he a little bit more introverted? Like there, there, there's some fundamental things that you can potentially take as a cue to know, okay, this person is, you know, more quote unquote, left brain, right brain, his aptitude is going to go into the arts and into the English versus, you know, the mathematics and then kind of tailor the best possible learning experience, but that sounds very new agey and probably nobody will ever even <laughs> think about doing that. Um, you know, you know, to your point in my little math experiment, I kind of based it a little bit off of Harry Potter. And the mm. way that I had it was that there was this line in the middle and there was like these two universes that you could see in front of you and you had a wand and these things would pop up on either side of this kind of, you know, divide and you would use your wand to bring balance into the world, you know? Right. And man, I gotta tell you, like, I started getting the feeling like I was able to do or figure out what the coefficient was, if I'm using that word correctly, mm -hmm. um, if I, it, you know, to like figure the answer for the coefficient quicker with this concept of the magic wand and like, you know, adding, it's like, okay, I, I, I tap on the frog and I make the frog this color and then like you know i take away you know the color from the other one and 
there, there's, there is something there. Like, you know, again, I didn't really solve it, but there, there's, there's, you know, like, like you said, I know people that would give you and me right now, a hundred million dollars if we could solve algebra for like, you know, you know for <laughs> kids, you know, it's, it's definitely the hundred million dollar question, but um, that's fascinating. So overall, that's your primary focus. You're a, you're an educator that that's where you spend most of your, most of your time. Oh, geez. I don't know. Um, so I think a lot of it is definitely education. Although, m you know, my job responsibilities in involve just as much uh, research. Mm -hmm. um, but I think it goes hand in hand. Like, there's, you know, going back to surgery, there's this famous, famous phrase. I don't even know if anyone knows the origin. It's uh, <laughs> learn one, do one, teach one. So you can't be a surgeon until you've learned how to do surgery, you've done a surgery, and most importantly, you've taught someone else how to do surgery. So right. I, I, you know, I- Learn one, do one, teach one. Yeah, so learn I- Learn one, do one, teach one. Yeah, so I, I like it's somewhat selfish in some sense that I, I think about education because I find it useful for myself. Like, I don't mm. feel like I understand something until I've gone through that process of, of teaching it to someone else. Well, that's fascinating. I, during the pandemic, I've been playing guitar my whole life. And it's like another thing that I've been terrible at my whole life. And like during the pandemic, um, I finally decided that I was going to learn guitar for real and like really get into it, you know, and get into the, you know, the mathematics of it. It's another place where mathematics shows its face, right? Like the patterns mm -hmm. and the scales and, and like, you know, um, and you're so right that you feel this incredible sense of understanding where you can explain what you're doing to somebody else. And for me, the big breakthrough with me with the guitar was learning something called uh, the caged system, which is a way to like sort of like break down the entire uh, fretboard so that you know basically where all the chords are and where all the patterns mm -hmm. are. And it uses this very simple concept of the caged system. And when I was able to explain the cage system to somebody else or explain to them how they could find any note on the guitar by just using logic and math, I'll never forget it now. You know, like, right. like <laughs> it, it's something that I, you know, that I know that I understand deeply. Do, do you play any instruments? Uh, not really. I used to play guitar back in when I was in high school, but uh, <laughs> yeah. there's no there's no time these days. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. It's a beautiful instrument. But look, it's something that you can always pick up. Like math, people that are good at math are good at you know are good at guitar. You know, like there mm. there there's some kind of people say, oh no, I'm good at the arts. I'm not good at math. Well, the arts are so much about math, right? If you mm. look at you know even like the Renaissance, you know, and like the breakthrough there or the breakthrough with like the early classical sculptures, you know, of the Greek era or, or, or music, people that are really good at music, like mathematics is, is fundamental to that. So with that, I'm going to ask you a question that you've probably heard a million times, but I <laughs> love hearing the answer of this. Do you think mathematics was a, was a human discovery or do you think it was a human invention? I, I think that perhaps it's like, it, it's, you know, the, there's no, if you take the right perspective, there's no difference mm. in, in those, those two things. Right. So I, I, my preference is for, it's a human invention in the sense mm. that at language itself is a, is a human invention, right? Mm. We, you know, it comes back to this sort of, we have a problem, we desperately want to solve it. And I'm sure if you were really careful about the history you would find there's like there's all sorts of false starts and mm. you know and and in some sense mathematics is the is successful through this evolution of many different ideas uh so we you know it wasn't like an intentional invention like uh you know i can declare it and patent it mm. but it was more you know a, like the evolution of language and what we end up with was is the thing that's most useful for us and, and do you think that mathematics, um, you know, has that moment of, of is the most important moment in mathematics when Isaac Newton writes Principia and like discovers this concept of calculus and like, 
you know, the industrial revolution happens like, you know, right after that. Right. So it must have been something special. Like, is that also your take that that's the moment where where humanity really took that giant leap forward? P possibly. I think, you know, that that that's probably a good a good place to start. I mean, I think there were people before Newton that, you, you know, used mathematics to explain the motion of the stars like Kepler. Sure. Yeah. So but yeah, the fact that. The, like the, I think the beautiful thing about about you know the one thing that Newton did, which was the universal law of gravitation, was like showing that you know with this very simple mathematical framework, you could explain an enormous amount of stuff. Right. Uh, but that also is, you know, that's that's a bit lucky. Like he kind of like found a found uh, this sort of pattern in nature where some the simplicity of it could be captured mm. in with mathematics and i don't think that we should expect that that will happen for every pattern that we see and, and this whole like kind of um you know legend that guys like me hear of him inventing calculus just to be able to explain his ideas is that an accurate understanding of what happened did he truly invent calculus to explain the motion of these large bodies. Yeah. Oh, I mean, I, I don't, I don't think we know the, the exact history of it. Sure. You know, it was calculus. Of course the, the, you know, he, Newton talked to lots of people, right. Um, see, he, I mean, he was, I, so far as I understand, he was a bit reclusive. Yeah. So I guess a lot of the stuff he did, you know, w w was on his own, but, you know, he still presented his work and got feedback and refined it based on what other people said. Uh, Leibniz in, you know, in, in Europe at the same time had a similar theory. The calculus that we learn in high school today doesn't resemble what, what Newton did, right? If you read well, you uh, learned it. I yeah. never got past it. I, <laughs> I, I, I still have no idea yeah. what it is, but yeah. Yeah, so what he you know he came up with a really crude sort of version of it, and it's been refined over 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 the last four hundred years um, to to be what it is is today. So you know he you could credit him with you know, this this really sort of popularizing this this kind of idea, but you know he didn't really invent something that is still used today. He started something that's been refined upon. Uh, you know, he he famously said himself, right? Um, if I've seen further, it's by standing on the shoulders of giants. Sure. Um, you know, for you know, for me, I I love to kind of romanticize things. And to your point, you you know, you you figured me out the first three minutes we were talking that I love to oversimplify things. And you know, for me, I like to think that humanity is kind of defined um, by its understanding of gravity. You know, um, you know. In your book, I'm sure you get into the the four fundamental forces, and it's something that I've always been super into. And I have a theory about a fifth one that Brian Greene was the only person that ever said, you know what, you might be onto something with that. <laughs> um, but um, the the concept of gravity seems to be this this incredible driving force of knowledge for humanity, right? You have um, the the whole um, Oh God, I'm going to mess it up. The, was it uh, the experiment on top of the Leaning Tower of Pisa where they drop? Mm. Uh, uh, was that uh, was that Galileo? Galileo. Yeah, 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 Galileo. Galileo. Yeah. So that you know that was a huge moment, right? And then you have obviously Newton, and then you have Albert Einstein comes in and optimizes that understanding of gravity by just a little bit, and boom, you have the atomic revolution, and like. You know, I keep dreaming that one of these days we're going to, you know, we're going to read a headline that one of these super colliders finds the graviton particle. Do you think that this is an inevitable step that's, that, that physics is going to take about identifying the true sort of fundamental nature of, of, of gravity? Or do you believe that maybe it doesn't even exist? Yeah, it, it, I mean, it's a, it's a huge, it's a huge question. Um, I you know, I don't, I don't know. Uh, I don't think, I don't think anybody knows. Um, mm. You know, you, when you get experts on, they usually 
have a specialty and that that's related to one of the proposals in which we can kind of unify gravity and the other three fundamental forces. And so they'll, they'll, you know, quickly say that I think it's going to be this way because, you know, that's, that's what their research is, is in. Right. But, but if they're honest, you know, I, we just don't know. We do, we don't, we need e experiments that probe a, a region of, uh, of the universe that will, that's really far removed from, from where we've been able to experiment so far. So the amount of energy, say, we need in a particle collider before we even see some of these proposed particles is far beyond what we might be able to achieve on Earth. Mm. So we may need to, to, to do something in, entirely different. And, and when, when you guys, um, are there sort of mathematical constants that are widely accepted for the uh, nature of gravity, like in terms of the graviton as a particle has X, Y, Z, you know, numbers or variables associated with it. Is there like a prediction of what the graviton particle is like? Yeah. So, I mean, for most proposed particles, we know roughly like what it would look like in, in the data if we, if we could find it. And m what these experiments do, you know, every experiment kind of narrows down. It basically rules out regions of like say, energies and, and speeds and all, all of these sort of fundamental things. It kind of rules out regions to say, okay, we, we haven't found it here. Mm -hmm. So we kind of are narrowing it down uh, so that we have a pretty good idea for, for these proposed particles that will be added to the standard model where where we will find them but many many of the really speculative ideas like uh, maybe you've heard of string theory if of course you're talking to to brian yeah, Green, yeah, yeah, yeah um it the amount of energies that you would need to say see a string uh in string theory are just astronomical like beyond our, you know our wildest dreams for what we could achieve Right. And that's one of his, you know, and he's look, Brian, you know, he's such a fascinating guy because he's got no golden cows, you know, like he's one of the most open minded people I've ever met. And that's really inspirational to me that he's always ready to be wrong and he's excited to be wrong, you know, because being <laughs> wrong teaches you something. And he says the same thing that string theory has always been protected by that veil of being impossible to prove or disprove, right? Like the mathematics. Mm -hmm works out but it's impossible to create empirical evidence to support what it's saying right like you know like it's very difficult to get that kind of data um do do you um in the standard model graviton is something that's quantifiable that people can use in equations um, in the same way they can use the other particles or are there still mysteries about some of its potential properties uh, you know, that much, that much, I I don't know. Uh, sure. It's it's a bit too far out of my my area of expertise. So you know, Fair I have enough. like I have like the pop science understanding <laughs> of it. But yeah. you know, I know that there, within the within the community of people who think about it, there's probably as much disagreement within them as there there is like outside of that outside of that discipline. Uh, yeah. So that's the, typically how how it how it goes within within science because look to take it back to like fun poppy stuff you mm -hmm. know there's been all this stuff coming out recently about ufo sightings and all of this stuff right and like right. the ufos are real the ufos are real and i do believe the ufos are real but i believe it's far more likely that the ufos are and this is going to sound absolutely insane but that the ufos mm -hmm. are potentially time travelers I actually think they're just modern day technology that's like a little bit more difficult to understand. But the idea that they're aliens is 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 so far fetched to me because of the understanding of of space time that Einstein kind of laid out for us about the reality of how difficult it is for us to travel massive amounts of distances like, you know, where the next planet, you know, that could inhabit a life form that's as sophisticated as us is, it's just, there's just this incredibly difficult barrier to get across 
But for me, the one thing that could maybe throw all that into flux is a deeper understanding of gravity, because then you could theoretically manipulate space time and move around quicker and all this kind of stuff. Um, so anyway, I have no question there, but, but the, you know, that, that's just for mm. me, like, <laughs> you know, when it comes to the four fundamental forces, you know, they're all great, those strong force, the weak force, um, and then gravity and electromagnetism, but gravity seems to be the one that is holding all the secrets, you know, and, and, and like, I wish I understood it deeper and, and, you know, had learned about it or had gotten excited about it when I was younger, more than now that I could just riff on it, but it's all nonsense <laughs> because none of it is based on math, you know? Well, I mean, even, you know, even people who study it at, with mathematics, you know, the, the, they've also hit, hit a boundary in the sense that w they know, <laughs> They know what they need to know to to improve upon their understanding. And if they want to take a leap forward, it's just beyond our grasp. So we need to, you know, be able to study black holes mm. that are nearby uh, to understand what, what happens inside of them. Right. Uh, you know, we can't just be looking off f far in the distance. Yeah. So. So I think that, you know, for me, I I don't tend to spend too much time thinking about things that I don't, that I wouldn't be able to improve my understanding of. So mm -hmm. if you take, take UF, UFOs, for example. Sure. What, what would I need to really kind of dig, get to the bottom of this, right? Well, if if these photos or whatever are coming from coming from a top secret government organization, then, then I, I would need top secret clearance, right? Right. To, to, right. Which I'm not going to get. I mean, I'm not a U.S. citizen, <laughs> right. so I'm not going to get top secret clearance. Um, so, so I don't think about it. I mean, I, you know, there's a finite amount of time and a finite amount of things one can think about. And, uh, I want to think about things where I know I'll be able to improve, improve upon my, my current understanding. That's and, an awesome way to look at it. Yeah. And for, for a lot of things, it's just like, it's just not, it's not, it's not possible. So don't, don't stress about it. Don't worry about it. Yeah. And that's the key word because what you just equated to me sounds like a recipe for relieving stress. You know, like, like when you start thinking about things that you absolutely have no control over, um, it creates unnecessary stress. You know, that's a very Zen way of looking at the world. I like that, you know, very much. So, so just to kind of, you know, as we're starting to wrap up here, um, what, what is your primary focus of, of, of research? What is it that, that, that you're most, um, uh, where is it that you feel like you could potentially learn the most and inform the most? I think that, you know, our research group does practical things like we have to get research grants. And so a lot of the a lot of the research is very practical. It's in trying to help build quantum technologies mm -hmm. uh, that I do a lot of education around talking about quantum technology, explaining what quantum computers are, that sort of thing mm. uh, that, you know, I, I'm kind of disappointed disappointed in some sense that like engineering isn't as glorified as, as other areas of science because it's so important to society. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. I mean, without, you know, the, the imaging scanners that have revolutionized the medical world and, you know, yeah, yeah. It's, you know, without quantum computing or, or without quantum physics, there's no cell phones, right? There's no right. antennas, you know, it's, it's, uh, there, there's no cell towers, I should say. Hmm. Um, no, no, it's a very noble thing. And, and, and have you experimented at all with quantum computing is this like something that you've seen like one that can do the third of three point calculation stuff like is that a real thing they're small prototype devices i mean it's it's growing very rapidly uh i think with there's this this notion that there'll be a point in time at which quantum computers will sort of overtake classical like digital computers the ones that we use today um, and that, I think that's a, a it, we won't actually see that. Like there isn't going to be like a, a singularity in the sense, like things will, will move a bit more slowly and transitions will be a bit more smoothly, especially for end users. 
you're not going to like completely change the way they interact with technology. Otherwise, no one's going to buy it. But so, but there will be a point at which a lot of technology will switch over to 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 using quantum processors for doing calculations, uh, and that you know I think nobody really knows when it will happen. But I think a, a good estimate that most people will agree on would be like 10 years, you know, we'll see a, a sort of shift in, in the way we do we do computations. But again, that, that's going to be behind the scenes. Uh, you know, if you're into like, you know, investing in technology, maybe you really want to be up on it. But if you're, you know, if you just want Which like, I am, so I'm <laughs> <laughs> if you want, if you want, like, just faster computers, right, if you want, like, Netflix to be able to stream 4k more reliably or whatever you don't really have to worry about it like if it's going to be useful for that then somebody will figure it out and in integrate it into the technology so that it's behind the scenes you don't have to interact with it but what i uh yeah what i what i what i like to think about in my free time is is understanding quantum physics at, at a deeper level there's so many questions that we have about quantum physics and the nature, how it relates to the nature of reality and the nature of sure. time and, and causation, these sorts of things that are, it's amazing that it's like, it's right here in front of us. Like we don't have to look out into the stars and we don't have to imagine, you know, what, you know, if there's life out there and, and all of these sort of really, really deep, but ultimately I think un unobtainable questions when we have so many questions right here in front of us that are, I think, sure. as e equally as interesting. Yeah, no, I, um, I, I have a decent understanding of the high concept, you know, I'm like a storyteller. I went to film school. So that's really my thing. And so from a high concept, I get the quantum physics story and it's quite, you know, quite, fa you know, fascinating, like the wave of probability and, and collapsing yeah. the wave into the actual place that the atom is at. Um, you know, to me, makes 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 good amount of sense. Um, you know, um, anything beyond that is just like you know, mind boggling. <laughs> I think people misinterpret quantum physics um, when they say that the that the observer changes reality. And sure, the observer changes reality, and that's that's just you know a kind of a poetic fact because each observer has their own reality, mm -hmm. but. Like, I think people misinterpret what that actually, uh, you know, means. You know, people say, like, you know, that the cat only dies when you look at it and, and stuff like that. Like, giving the consciousness this kind of superpower. Um, mm -hmm. And I think that that has confused a lot of people into turning um, quantum physics into, like, the dark arts, you know, like, of sorts, <laughs> yeah. you know. Because, like, yeah. there's, like, there's, like, this concept of, like, the consciousness manipulates the like the position of the atom and they're not even thinking about the position of the atom they just think that like things like a billion different or like an infinite amount of possibilities are happening but only when i look at it does the real one sh you know show its face hmm. and, and and i think somehow it's a nice story but i think that that's actually hurt people's understanding of of quantum physics you know because the whole schrodinger's cat experiment is an extremely complicated concept that I think people oversimplify to what to what it actually you know is, and that's look I've lost myself saying that, so you know that's what people probably get <laughs> lost with those you know with those kind yeah. of things. Well, I, I mean, I, I I really like this this sort of mentality that you know we we have these stories about the world, the mm. stories about quantum physics, stories about you know the the thought experiments about the cat. Uh, and it's okay to have multiple conflicting stories about one thing, right? They, mm -hmm. they, you know, one might be useful in one situation uh, versus another. And I, we get trapped in this sort of false dichotomy that there are that, like things are black and white. There's truth and there's false. Sure. And the a perfect example is like the, for me, the earth is flat. If I want to go to the grocery <laughs> store, I don't think about the curvature of the earth, right? Right, right. The curvature of the earth is almost irrelevant to my daily life, right? If I well, if I powerful. want to like imagine, okay, if I'm on a mat, if I really wanted to think, okay, well, you know, we'll, we'll, you know, 
or explain to someone, you know, you know, why, why is it the, what is the solstice and why is it the solstice? Uh, is it yesterday, I guess? Uh, why, why was it yesterday? Then I have to explain, okay, well, the earth is like this spherical thing and, it, right, and that's it's precious, really not yeah. even a sphere, right? It's like a, it's a, it's like kind of like a more of a, it's technically an oblate spheroid. It's wider at the, at the equator than it is at the, at the poles. Right. So, right. So, you know, we have all of these stories and, Simple stories are fine, but the problem is that you can't extrapolate those stories into re like regimes where they're not no longer useful. So, mm. like having this sort of non mathematical story of quantum physics, it's great. Like it, you know that. Like I I hold that story in my mind as well, right? But if I want to go and like actually solve something, then I have to go back to the more detailed mathematical story. And so I think, you know, this is, it's fine to have these stories, but the, the, as you say, like the problem most people get trapped in is that they think that's the truth. And so then they extrapolate the, some lesson that they want to take from that story into a regime where it certainly do, doesn't, doesn't hold anymore. It's not useful in that, in that, in that area. Well, but you just blew my mind thinking that it's okay to, to believe the world is flat because for some scenarios it absolutely is flat and you can even like prove it mathematically right it depends how far you're going sure, right but yeah. the, but but the math holds up to an extent you know so every God, time you, you take just, out a map every time you take out a map it's yeah. a story can it's you a just story turn into about... a flat earther <laughs> into yeah. A yeah that's not what i thought was going to happen but um <laughs> God, you're so right that in practice sometimes knowing the full picture or the quote unquote reality is not practical. Yeah. You know, it's not useful. That, yeah. Yeah. We're so, never going to use quantum physics to like, uh, you know, help us with Google maps and navigating around the, around the world. Right. Even if, if we have a complete understanding of it, it's just not useful. So we just yeah. have all of these, these stories that are useful in some, some regimes or other, but people just have to, you know, I think that's a good way to go through life is to, to understand this point that you know we we hold these stories and these are the you know th this is the way we build our reality but you'll you'll be able to achieve so much more and and have more comfort and less anxiety if if you're willing to uh, to change and, and adopt different stories in different st situations based on on what's what's currently useful yeah well, Dr. Ferry, that's a beautiful place to leave it off of. I, I, um, I'm I, so happy I got a chance to chat with you. Um, I'll put all your info um, for your for your books. You know, um, if you go to Amazon and you just look up Chris Ferry, there's so many books <laughs> that you've written. Everything is five stars. You know, that's where I started really getting impressed. Like you got <laughs> like six, 7,000 uh, reviews, everything five stars. So obviously people really love your work. And I'm very excited that I got a chance to uh, chat with you, man. And I appreciate you being the first person to collapse the wave of probability of this really <laughs> weird NFT based podcast uh, that I'm doing for my metaverse and offline. Um, I'll send you a text. You should definitely send me your email. I'll add you to the club metaverse, uh, uh, you know, beta group so that you can, uh, you know, the game will show up right in your Oculus store and you can check it out. Um, because awesome. I'm, I'm obsessed with trying to build, you know, the simulation, you know, how people say that, you know, the simulation theory that, you know, how do, how do we know we're in a simulation or not? I want to be the guy who builds that simulation. So hopefully, you know, <laughs> <laughs> this, you know, this game gets us there, but Dr. Ferry, man, thank you so much for your kind, uh, for your kindness and your time. I really, really appreciate it. Thanks for having me.